Hello and welcome to our Friday webinar. Um, today's topic is, well, we're doing another episode of the Avian Vet Insider with Dr. Stephanie Lamb. And today's topic is what's wrong with that bird? Rare and fascinating avian medicine ca uh, cases. So thank you all for joining us today. Um, and thank you, Dr. Lamb, always for joining us on Fridays during your, your time between seeing avian patients and all that good stuff. So, um, of course. so welcome back. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then, and then, of course, you've got a royal with you. Is that a sled on his little play pit? It looks like. No, it's um. What it is is because he used to be in our old office where we were before. He was actually up front, um, like behind the reception area, and and I had made some little like signs that say tricks of what he can do so that people who would come in and could see him could ask him to do tricks, um, and he'd get treats for it. Oh, ah, very nice. Okay. Yeah. All right. That's pretty cool. And and uh, I'm sorry, I don't remember seeing those images behind you. those. Look <laughs> yeah, I had to swap computer stations. Um, so now I'm just talking to you guys from a different angle. And so okay. it's a whole bunch of um, photos that we have up there. They're actually from Dr. Scott Eccles' uh, oh. SPT scans. So wow. the, yes, the one is a curacao. The one that's kind of gray right over here is a curacao. Um, and it's just a CT scan showing the skeletal system. The other one is an alligator um, and it's showing skeletal system plus some of the vasculature. And then the other one is a pigeon um, and it's just showing the vasculature of the pigeon. So that's all the blood vessels in the head of a pigeon. Like all the, the CT imaging scan was able to essentially like take away the bones and all that sort of yeah. stuff from it. So um, it is just the, the head of the pigeon simply the blood vessels in it. So wow. I mean, it's like, it's like fascinating artwork, like literally like yeah. it, and it <laughs> serves a purpose. That's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for walking us through that. Um, all right. Do you have a screen share for us today? I we... do have a screen share okay. for us today. Okay. And if we have time for questions at the end, just to remind everybody to use the Q&A chat feature um, and not the uh, chat, or I'm sorry, the Q&A button feature and not the chat feature. So there we go. And I'll let you take it away. All right. Let me go ahead and share my screen here. And get our PowerPoint up. There we go. All right. So we're going to talk about uh, rare and fascinating cases. And so, so as I go through some of these things, some of them like truly are unexpected things um, that were found and other things are um, disease presentations that thought one thing to begin with, but that turned out it was something different. Um, and also some things that may be more like emerging problems or problems that are, are somewhat common, but not really well known about. Um, so they make, that makes them kind of in the fascinating category, I guess. Um, and then, oh, here comes a royal. <laughs> um, some, some just kind of neat things that I think people don't realize we can always do with birds, um, but are, are interesting to talk about because the more people know about what we are able to do with, with birds, maybe the more birds will get to be able to help in the long run. So. All right, um, so starting the, the talk off, I just put this slide up here, you know. Um, it's me doing a physical exam on a, on a turkey, actually. Um, when people initially come into the hospital, you know, they're coming in usually with some sort of problem that is going on with their pet. And, um, you know, they ask, hey, what, what's going on with my bird, doctor? You know, there's something that's awry here and we, we want to get our bird helped and figure out what's going on so that we can get them feeling good being a normal bird again. Um, and really, it all starts off with a good, appropriate physical examination, um, which we have talked about many times before. And we do have webinars on it as well. So if anybody wants to know what happens with uh, a physical examination on a bird, they can go back to watch some of those old lectures that we have given before um, and see kind of like what we do when we go through our physical examinations and also what we do after the physical exam. Because a physical exam is part of the, exam, the whole process of figuring something out. Um, it's definitely like the best diagnostic that we have, just getting our hands on them, getting looked and looked at. Um, 
But then we do often have to do tests and other things to really narrow it down and, and figure out what exactly is going on. So good physical exam, step one. All right, now when, when births are coming into the hospital, sometimes we see things that are, <coughs> excuse me, really common problems. Um, and I just put a couple of pictures up there of some common things that birds are coming in for. You can see the African gray on the far left uh, corner of the screen. That bird came in for feather, pl feather plucking. You can see how the feathers are sort of chewed along the back. A common problem that we are dealing with in our pet birds, but not always a simple problem, but a common problem. Um, next picture is a picture of a fractured wing on a bird. Um, and, and what we have here, you can, you can see right at the center of the image, this is the, the bigger bone here is the ulna. The smaller bone is the radius in the bird's wing, the sort of forearm area. And you can see right at the center there, there's a pretty dramatic fracture that this poor bird sustained. Um, the radius and the ulna are both broken and they're actually broken in little fragments right at the point of uh, highest pressure from the impact of the damage that occurred to that wing. Um, again, we, we see fractures really commonly in birds in a variety of locations. Uh, this next picture is a cute little canary who, other common thing that we'll see, just little injuries, you know, cuts, scrapes, um, somebody chewed on somebody else's toe, um, or they got a toe stuck in like a cage door or something like that. Um, so just common problem we're having to put bandages on for a variety of reasons. And then this last photo over here in the far right is a picture of a conure um, that has sort of a big belly. And we do see big bellies on birds for a variety of reasons. Normally they have a very concave abdomen. So normally when we look at the abdomen of bird, it's sort of like be concave and kind of compressed in a little bit, but you can see this bird's belly is sort of big and protruding. A variety of reasons can occur that cause that. Um, a lot of reproductive problems that we see can cause them to have fluid buildup or sometimes liver problems or other things. Um, again, other things that we have talked about um, in previous webinars uh, hit on that particular issue of birth. So if you're interested in those common problems, uh, we did do a webinar uh, a few months ago regarding that, that people could always go back and watch if they like. Okay, so those are the common things, just some common issues we see, but what about when it's a little bit more complex and a little bit more difficult to figure out? Um, I'm gonna go over first case. This is an African gray. Um, this is not the picture of the African gray in question. This is actually one of my grays, but she decided to model for, for the photo. Um, but this particular African gray that we had come into the office, he presented to the hospital, um, just really for a wellness visit. He had just come in simply for a wellness visit. No real problems. He just needed some grooming as well, beak trim, some uh, toenail trim, that sort of stuff. Um, but he was 25 years old. So we said, well, you know, it's a good time to run some blood on him and just make sure that everything is functioning okay internally and that there aren't any problems that are going on that we need to assess for. So we did our physical exam, he looked pretty good on the physical, uh, and then we drew some, some blood uh, to, in order to do these just sort of screening tests. And what I have over on this picture here is just an example of how we kind of get our, our blood work back. Um, we often do what's called a complete blood count, and you can see the name of it right there. Um, complete blood counts allow us to look at red cells and white cells and thrombocytes. We'll often do chemistry panels as well. This just has, this screenshot here just has a little photo of um, some chemistry findings. It shows our bile acids test. Um, and then this bird in, bird in particular also had um, some infectious diseases that we tested it for as well. And you'll see that we have our results. Um, and then they'll often also give us a little idea of where this patient particularly falls in the normal ranges of what that result should be in. And you can see that this bird in particular had a pretty normal um, CBC, all its parameters are falling in the appropriate ranges. But if you look up here at this one chemistry panel value that we looked at, the bile acids, you can see that little star is showing it's an outlier. When you look at your normal ranges versus the result that came up for this bird, it shows that his bile acids is higher than what it should be. Now, everything else was, was pretty much okay. There were some fat levels that were off a little bit too. And we do see bile acids elevated with some frequency in birth, 
it's actually somewhat of a common problem that we identify as high bile acids, but what does that mean? Bile acids are an indicator of how the liver is functioning. And go up in a couple of other circumstances, but for the most part, if you have a high bile acids level, we're worried about liver problems. And for this bird in particular, we saw this slight elevation of bile acids. And we're like, well, you know, there might be something going on with its liver. We talked about diet. There were a couple little things in the diet that could potentially have been a contributing factor to um, potentially something like fatty liver syndrome. Fatty liver syndrome is a real common problem that we see in birds causing them to have high liver values. So um, we talked about that as a possibility and we decided, well, rather than do anything too invasive because he's doing really well, let's go ahead and just kind of follow him for a little while. We'll make these dietary adjustments. We gave him a um, supplement called milk thistle that helps with how the liver is functioning essentially. Um, and we said, let's see him back and just kind of follow this out and see what, what happens. So as he was just kind of coming back for his regular routine wellnesses and everything, uh, we, we watched him and, and ran blood work on him over several different time points. So you can see I have different dates here um, and what his bile acids levels were. And again, if we refer back up to what our normal reference range was, we can see that oh, he's still out of that reference range. And this was after we um, did a little bit of dietary changes and we put him on milk thistle. So if he had fatty liver syndrome, he really should not have been having his bile acids getting any worse. And in fact, with our dietary, dietary changes and our milk thistle, kind of would have expected that the bile acids would be getting better. Um, but in fact, it wasn't. It wasn't doing what we thought it should be doing with our supportive care that we were treating him with for the most likely thing that was going on. Um, he did also start to have some increases in fat levels. And this value here, LDH, that's just an other liver enzyme that we can look at. Um, and he, at various times, had it being off a little bit as well. So we continued to talk with him about, well, you know, there might be something else going on. Maybe we need to do some more diagnostics. But we, we held off because it wasn't, again, too bad. He came back later and things were looking a little bit better, but his fat levels were a little higher, which was kind of weird. And one of his enzymes was a little higher. So we still, you know, continued his milk thistle, continued talking about diet stuff and talk about maybe we need to be looking into this a little bit more. Followed him out a few more times. And as you can see, eventually we got to the point where we had a really, really, really high increase in his bile acids level. And so at that point, when our bile acids was substantially higher than what it should have been in the normal ranges, we said, you know what, what we're doing isn't working. The milk thistle that we're doing isn't seeming to make any effect on him. The diet that we're doing really isn't changing anything. And his diet seemed like it was pretty good at that point. So something else is going on with this bird that's making it have these liver value changes and these, these changes that are progressing. Um, and, and we really probably need to do something a little bit more in depth here to, to figure this out and know what is actually going on. So, um, the owner said, okay, let's go ahead and, and do further diagnostics. And at that point, we decided that, you know, the thing that's probably going to give us the most help is if we get a biopsy of the liver itself, because when you get a biopsy of an organ that is having a problem, you can send it off to a pathologist. A pathologist can look at it underneath a microscope, see changes at the cellular level, and tell you what's going on. And it seemed like that was probably going to be the most direct way to really help this bird out and figure out what was going on. So we went ahead and took him to surgery. And um, this is just a picture of an African gray that we were preparing to take for surgery. Um, and so I don't think I've really shown too many surgery pictures in my other talks that I've given with you guys. So this is just a bird that's actually prepared for surgery. We're not in surgery yet with this bird, but what you can see in the picture, he's got this tape around his beak here. And unfortunately I cut the picture off. I'm not always the best picture taker, um, but he had a tube that was down his throat uh, feeding into his trachea so that we could get oxygen and the anesthetic down the trachea down to um, allow the gas that we're giving the anesthetic gas to get to the lungs where it needs to be in order to work. This little tube that we have in the trachea as well is also protecting the airway so that nothing is accidentally getting down that airway. He also, on this picture, you can see all these little leads. What these are, these are um, ECG leads. 
And so these are actually clamped um, to the needles that were actually put through the skin. And what they're doing is we're picking up an ECG from his heart, you know, so we can assess his electrical activity while he is under anesthesia. And then this little thing right here, this is actually an IV catheter that's placed in the wing vein over here um, so that we can give him continuous IV fluids during the anesthetic event so that he is maintaining his blood pressure more appropriately. So we're doing things, uh, this is him prepped before the, the, the procedure to have a biopsy. So we're keeping, we're monitoring him appropriately and doing everything we possibly can to keep this a safe anesthetic procedure for him. So we went in, we took a small little liver biopsy of him, closed him up, sent him home um, and sent the liver biopsy out. Now biopsies do usually take several days to even sometimes up to several weeks to get a final result in. And when we sent the, the sample off, um, the pathologist came back with an answer that I really was not expecting for this particular species of bird. What I have here is actual pictures of um, the liver samples themselves and they're stained with different stains so that we can evaluate essentially um, what's going on at that cellular level. Um, and what the pathologist ended up informing us was present was a condition called um, iron storage disease. And so iron storage disease is probably something a lot of people have heard about because it's actually something that people can get, people can get iron storage disease. Um, but animals can get iron storage disease too. And there are certain species of birds that are more prone to iron storage disease, but African greys are definitely not one of those species. The species that we see iron storage disease more in are gonna be like our, our toucans actually, which um, not a lot of people are seeing pet toucans. I mean, pet toucans are a thing, they do exist, um, but there's not a lot of people who have pet toucans. Um, so, but it is a, a problem that if you have a pet toucan, something you need to be aware of. Um, or a toucan in a zoo, um, you know, keepers need to be aware of that particular problem that they can have. But basically what it is is the buildup of iron in the liver and that iron builds up and it's causing tissue damage. And it basically causes scarring in the liver. And it replaces, that scar tissue replaces normal healthy liver cells. Um, now the parrot species that you can actually see iron storage somewhat frequently in are lorries and lorikeets. They're the species that's a little more well known for it, but definitely not African gray parrots. So this was one that I was, when I got the uh, pathology results back from the pathologist, I was like, oh my gosh, uh, not expecting that at all. Uh, I even when we get these sort of results, you often read them a couple of times, make sure that there wasn't some sort of error in the result that you got back. Like, did I, is this, is this, the right name for this patient? Like, uh, is this the right result? Um, or sometimes I, in this case, I even like reached back out to the pathologist and was like, wow, I wasn't expecting that. That's really interesting. And then I asked the pathologist, is this something that you find often? The pathologist had said, no, not for this particular species. And this particular pathologist is great because she um, keeps record of a lot of different, oh, she keeps record of everything really. Um, and she was able to send me information on all the parrot patients she had that she had ever done uh, biopsy samples from the liver on and, and what once had this particular problem. And it was something that um, was not really uh, at all commonly found in the African gray parrot. Um, and what we can actually see in these slides here, which I think shows up probably the best in this slide here, because there's different stains that they use to allow us to be able to visualize um, the iron pigments, but all these like little blue flecks, if you look at this last stain on the right here, these little blue flecks, those are actually um, iron that's being picked up by um, the stain that they were using. Um, and you can see it's inside of all these, all these cells. Um, so there's quite a bit of iron in here that's not supposed to be. Um, so what did we do for this patient? Well, when we're dealing with iron storage disease, what we need to do is we need to get them on um, certain medications that help to essentially bind up that iron and help him excrete it from the body. And so this picture here is uh, the medication that was used for this particular patient. Um, and then the other thing that I wrote down that we need to do is dietary adjustments. We do have 
to adjust the diet slightly to make it so that they are eating a low iron diet because a lot of these species that we know about iron storage disease more in the African gray, um, we know that for them, it does seem to be at least a component of it, something interfering with or something abnormal with the way that they're absorbing iron. So we try to keep their iron levels in their diet really low so that they are not having um, this problem be present. Um, so we did a massive dietary change. Even though the bird was on a good diet, it still needed to be adjusted for the individual, which I think is something that's really important um, to really understand regarding diets, because you can have a good diet, you can have a diet that's appropriate for many individuals, but it may not be appropriate for this individual. So dietary things are um, something that have to be tailored to the individual. So we really just did a massive overhaul on the patient's diet to make sure we're getting as low of iron levels as possible. We were really strict about the, the treats that the bird was getting as well. Um, and so this, the patient did great, which is wonderful because the sad thing is, is some of the species that we see this much more frequently in, a lot of times by the time that they, like, by the time they start showing signs of the disease, it's really too far advanced. And um, something that's hard to really help them with sometimes. Um, and the great thing is, is that this individual, we were able to help before it actually was a problem. They weren't even showing any signs and we were able to identify that something was going on. We were able to help them before we really have any issues. So now um, in the future, this patient may need treatments again, um, but at this point in time, the liver values that we have been monitoring to assess how that liver is functioning have been staying pretty good. Um, so I think everybody's really happy, but definitely a, a different case that we were kind of not expecting to, to have. Okay, um, the next case that I wanted to talk about is this one of an eclectus parent. Uh, this one, uh, this is Kiki. Um, she's an example of a patient where sometimes patients may present with an issue that's common, um, but we find out that for this individual, um, there is something a little bit more involved going on. Um, and in her case, originally what happened was she was in her, her mid twenties when she originally presented and uh, she presented with some reproductive problems. And again, like, I, like I've said before, reproductive problems are, are very common in birds. There's a variety of reproductive disorders that can happen, but certain reproductive problems are more common than others. Uh, egg binding, low calcium problems, um, egg yolk celomitis, those sort of things are a little bit more common in our, our pet parents when it comes to reproductive pathologies. So Kiki came in, um, she was kind of quiet, not her regular self. She was um, having this sort of big belly that you'll have on the females when they are sometimes being hormonal. Um, she also wasn't eating as much as she normally should be. We ended up doing blood work and x-rays on her to figure out what was going on. And on her x-rays, we were able to see what looked like a compressed egg. And it was kind of like um, this, rather than being a nice big oval, it was sort of this like, um, almost like a linear kind of thing. Uh, you could tell that it was calcified. It looked like it was in the region of the oviduct. Um, and so I said, okay, it looks like she's got this really abnormally shelled egg. Um, her blood work was consistent with a hormonally cycling female. She had some high fat levels. Um, and we said, all right, well, you know, we need to get in there and get that thing out because she's probably not going to pass that thing on her own, um, because it was really oddly shaped, you know? So we elected to take her to surgery to, to remove that structure, but because she was a little off, we didn't want to rush into surgery. There's a lot of patients where if we rush into surgery right away, they're not stable, they're not ready for surgery, and that could be putting them at a big risk when they're under anesthesia. So sometimes what we have to do is we have to get them stabilized first, we need to do a few days or sometimes even a week or so of supportive care, and then we can take them to surgery so that we're being as safe as possible and not running into any problems. Um, and in her case, that's what we decided to do. We said, well, we need to stabilize her first. 
So she was given fluid, supportive care. She was given calcium. Um, she was put on some anti-inflammatories. And uh, I think it was probably, I forget the exact length of time, but it was probably with like a week or so uh, after her initial presentation that we were like, okay, she should be ready to, to go to surgery. So we took her to surgery. Um, and the goal of surgery was not only get that little piece of an egg out of her, but also um, go ahead and spay her at the same time so that we could prevent her from forming further eggs in the future. And she made this really weird egg. We thought, ah, we don't really want her to have um, any more further eggs in the future. Um, so let's go ahead and just spay her all at the same time. Took her to surgery, spayed her. Within the oviduct, there was a structure that looked like a compressed egg that was sort of linear in shape. Um, and so we removed the whole thing and everything seemed fine. Pretty, pretty what we would expect, I guess, typical, you could say, uh, what should be expected for that particular surgery. So um, she did good, we sent her home. But a few days into being home, mom said, you know, she's still not right. There's still something that's wrong with her. Like, uh, you know, she she just isn't what I need her to be. She seems like she's still really uncomfortable. I'm worried that there's something more going on with her. So we said, okay, you know, bring her back. We need to see what's going on so that we can help her further. And um, when she came back, we took another x-ray um, and, when we took another x-ray, that compressed sort of linear egg thing that I thought I had taken out during surgery was there. And, but it was a slightly different spot. And I was like, wait a second, I, I removed that thing. Um, why is that thing there? This is really confusing. Um, and also, why is it a different spot? Was I seeing something different on the x-ray? And when we went to surgery, like the thing that I pulled out of the oviduct, it was a piece of an egg. It was just like shell membrane with a little bit of calcium. But did that thing form while we were stabilizing her? We need to go back into surgery. So we ended up taking her back to surgery um, and had to you know, look around to find what it was. Where was that little thing that I was seeing on the x-ray that I thought I had taken out? Um, and it turns out, I think I have the next picture here. Oh, I wanted to show this first. Um, before I show you what happened, uh, when we went into surgery, normally this is the female reproductive tract. Um, and so when we open them up, we see this tubular structure on the left side of the body. And that is the oviduct. And at the top of the oviduct, you have your ovary that is producing little follicles. And those are the little yolks that are inside of an egg. Uh, little follicle or a yolk pops off the, the ovary and it gets grabbed by the oviduct here. Um, and it travels down the oviduct. And based on what portion of the oviduct it's in, it gets different layers of that egg placed on it. Um, and then it, at the very end, that's like the, this portion down here by the uterus, it actually gets the calcium put on the outer shell of that egg, and then it's ready to be passed out the cloaca. Um, and so when we spay them, what we do is we actually remove the entire oviduct itself, but we leave the ovary because ovary is actually really close to some really important blood vessels. Um, and so it's kind of dangerous to remove the ovary, so we usually do not, um, and we just remove the oviduct. So when I had gone in surgically, that's what I had done. I had removed the oviduct and in this portion, the uterus portion, that's where I found that little structure that was a slightly calcified, irregularly shaped um, piece of, of egg material. Um, so when I went back into surgery, I had to look around because all of this was gone because I had taken it out. Um, and I had to kind of push intestines out of the way. Now, normally this is, this is a perfect, like nice little anatomy picture of it. It never looks like this when you actually go inside because there's other things, you know, like we have intestines that are all sitting on top of there and the liver. And so um, I had to push the intestines out of the way and I was looking around trying to find out what was going on. And then I found this thing. And so this was um, an egg and you, I cracked it open. So you can see like even here, there's like a little bit of yolky stuff on the inside. And this is the outer portion of the egg, like the shell membranes, those different layers. Like I was saying, the, and we'll go back to this photo here again. 
a follicle pops off, it moves down the oviduct, goes through the different layers of the oviduct, gets membranes placed on it, gets the white of the egg added to it, um, and then goes down into the uterus and has calcium laid on that outer portion. And sometimes what happens, it's not common, but it happens, and it happened in this case, is that egg moved down. You can see how, go back to that picture. Well, go back. Yeah. Okay, there we go. Um, how linear that is. Like it's not a nice normal formed egg. It's kind of shaped and then like curled weird on the end. Um, sometimes you have stuff go down that obita, get different layers of the shell put on it. But then sometimes in really weird circumstances, it actually retrofluxes back up. So everything moves down and gets layers and then it goes, Boop, I'm going the wrong way and comes back up and then can be released free into the abdomen. And that's called an ectopic egg. It doesn't happen very often, but it, it occasionally will. And when it does, um, oh, no, don't do that. He's trying to take my ear off. Um, when it does happen, then you have an egg that's, that's free um, in the abdomen. And an egg's not supposed to be free in the abdomen because it's not gonna go anywhere. It's just gonna wow. sit there and it's gonna be very locally irritating. Um, so, we went and got this thing out. Now, what happened the first time, I think, because again, I had found some little linear thing in the lower portion of that oviduct when I had ruined it. What I think probably happened, why why I didn't find this thing originally and think that I had gotten there, the thing is because I think she probably, in that week period of time where we were trying to stabilize her to take her to surgery, I think she ovulated again and was trying to form an other egg. And it was also becoming weird, but it was staying in the oviduct where it's supposed to stay. Um, and so when I took it out, I thought I had the whole thing because I didn't take an other x-ray before the actual procedure. Um, because I thought, well, I had an x-ray from a week before we knew what was going on. I didn't think I needed another x-ray, but in this particular situation, I did need another x-ray. Because if I had I have taken an x-ray before the actual, like the date of the procedure, I would have seen that there were two things and I would have known okay, I'm actually looking for two different things. But hindsight's 2020. Um, so we got this this out, um, and she was much happier when that thing was out of her. She was much more comfortable because you gotta imagine that this is probably pretty uncomfortable having this structure just sitting in the um, band, sitting right next to the intestines, and it is slightly calcified. So so it's got to be a little irritating. All right. So that was that was my sort of uh, common presentation but weird actual problem going on with the bird case. So fascinating. Wow. All right. Um, this one I wanted to show, I wrote at the bottom there, some problems may look like something benign, but they're actually something more serious going on. Um, and if you look at this picture, it's, it's a close up of a cockatiel. Um, you can see his eye right here, and you can see his eye doesn't look right. He's got all this gunk sort of built up on the feathers behind the eye, and you've got this little pink blob right down in the, the corner of the eye. Um, and when you look at that, you know, it looks like it's probably not anything that's too serious. It looks like um, it's probably just a conjunctivitis, which, you know, people get conjunctivitis. Um, it's basically just inflammation of that conjunctiva, which is sort of those like little soft tissue pink structure that's sort of around the, the eye. Um, and when you get inflammation of there, a lot of times it's just, you know, there's something that was locally irritating, maybe a little bacterial infection, maybe they scrape the eye, something like that happens to allow for this to occur. And usually you just need to put a patient on some eye drops um, and they're often feeling better pretty soon. Um, so it looks like a benign problem, but this particular issue was actually something much, much more serious um, in this in this bird. And it's actually something that I wanted to bring up as well because it's something that I would would say is sort of a um, not necessarily sort of like an emerging disease, maybe because um, I wouldn't say it's extremely common, but it is something that is known about in the cockatiel specifically. So it's like an issue for this group of birds, this species of birds, um, but it is something that's only more recently been written about and published about. Um, people like pathologists have kind of known about it for some time, um, but then to make it out to like the, the general veterinary population, um, it's something that's maybe a little bit more recent to have been put out there for us all to know about. Um, and what it actually is, 
is, yes, it's conjunctivitis because there's inflammation of that conjunctival tissue. When a biopsy was taken of this area, just like we talked about before, the biopsy um, in the African gray of the liver where we found the iron in there that we were not expecting, when a biopsy was taken of this patient because it wasn't getting better, it was put on eye drops, um, but it wasn't improving the way it really should have. Um, what we found was that it actually had a problem called um, mycobacteria. Now, again, this is where our histology is helping. Again, our pathologists help us out. Um, what I have is two different two different slides of this conjunctival tissue, um, and it's underneath the microscope. So when we send tissue samples off, the pathologists they uh, cut them into little sections, they stain them, they put them on the microscope slide, and they have a look and see what's going on. So this is actually what a pathologist is looking at when we send out tissue samples. Um, and what we're seeing on this side here, where the arrow is sort of pointing to, is what's called um, a granuloma. And which is basically a bunch of inflammatory cells, macrophages in particular, kind of congealing together. And when you have a bunch of those inflammatory cells congealing together, they're trying to fight something off. You know, there is some foreign material and there are some foreign um, infectious agent that shouldn't be there. And the body's saying, hey, this is not supposed to be here. We need to go after this. We need to attack it. And sometimes they send so many inflammatory cells in that you get these big, uh, globs of, of inflammatory cells together. It's called a granuloma. Now, when a pathologist sees this, they go, oh, this is often seen with certain diseases. So let's do these special stains to see if we can highlight any of the organisms that could be present causing this problem. And they did a special stain called an acid fast stain. And you see all these little pink spots. So this is just a different like section of the same sample. Um, they just stained it with a different stain. And all these little pink spots those are acid fast organisms and mycobacteria is an acid fast organism. Now, mycobacteria may not sound like too common of a um, bacterial name that people have heard about, but what most people have heard more about that is sort of a more common name um, is tuberculosis. Mm -hmm. So people know about tuberculosis. Um, it's certainly still a problem, used to be a lot more of a problem, um, you know, like hundred years ago. Um, but it is still a problem. I mean, people get tuberculosis and it, it can be quite debilitating. Now, the thing is, is there's lots of different species of tuberculosis. So tuberculosis in people is often caused by mycobacterium tuberculosis, but there's actually other types of tuberculosis. There's tuberculosis avium, tuberculosis, or, or sorry, um, mycobacterium avium, mycobacterium genovans. There's many, many different species of that mycobacterium organism. Um, so this one in, in a lot of these cockatiels is actually one called Mycobacterium genovense. It's the most common uh, tuberculosis organism or mycobacterial organism that you see in birds causing these problems. And the problem with tuberculosis is, so yes, this patient, it looks like it's just a little conjunctivitis, but the problem is, is sometimes it's involving other tissue and other organs. Uh, not always, which is interesting with these, cockatiels with this problem. If you're lucky, it's just affecting the eye, but sometimes it's affecting other organs. Um, and later on the down the road, they might start having problems with other organs and how they're functioning. And one of the things that people worry about in this particular problem is that though it has not been documented yet, this is something that people worry about could potentially transmit from birds to humans. What's interesting is um, there has been documentation of the other way around, or people have given tuberculosis to birds. There hasn't been any documentation yet of birds giving tuberculosis to people. We don't want that to happen, of course. Um, and we certainly don't want it to be the other way either. We don't like to share diseases with our pets. Um, but it is something that when you have a bird that has this, if, if I diagnose this in a bird, I have to have a very serious conversation with the owners of, you know, this is something, this is a pathogen that potentially you could get from your bird. It can be pretty serious especially for children, elderly, or immunocompromised people. So we have to make a decision of how we're gonna deal with it. So um, again, something that's like starting maybe to become a problem. So like, it, it's interesting. Um, it's maybe more of an emerging disease, but not something that I would say, like I probably see one of these cases like maybe once every, I don't know, uh, several years, you know? So it's, it's, it's not, Super common, but 
definitely something I need to have be on the lookout for when I see a cockatiel with a lesion like that. Um, so this, this particular case that I wanted to talk about, um, it's actually quite a group of cases really. Um, we kind of touched on it a little bit last time, the last talk that we had, uh, when we were talking about like the most common species that I get to see in the office, um, when we were talking about the little like green cheek conures, I kind of brought this up for a moment. Um, and it's something that I don't see this all the time, but I probably see a case like this once every couple of years, or sometimes I'll have like a little like a uh, cluster of them, and then I won't see it for a period of time. Um, but what this is uh, that I wanted to talk with you guys about um, is these little conures sometimes are not so good about eating things that uh, being discriminant eaters and eating things appropriately. Um, as we talked about the last time, I kind of briefly mentioned about the little like hut things, the little fiber, um, the, like little synthetic fiber huts that parrots can have um, that people will often use to make like a little sleepy area for their bird. Um, Conyers seem to really love these. Conyers seem to just absolutely adore having those little triangle huts that they can get inside of um, and sort of nest in. But the problem that I often see associated with that I would say more commonly is reproductive problems. That's probably one of the big things is they get inside of those little cozy huts. Um, they feel rather, rather cushy and comfortable. And sometimes that brings about hormone problems. Um, but the other thing that I see that isn't extremely common, but it's common enough that when I see it, it's something I definitely am not happy to see is sometimes they eat those fibers that are inside those little huts. And they may do it very slowly over years even, um, but they'll pick at the little huts and they'll kind of like pick at a, maybe a little area, um, just kind of pulling it up. And maybe they're only swallowing one little fiber or two little fibers here or there. The problem is, is it's really hard for those fibers to actually pass out of the stomach. What happens is over a period of time, if you have, one little fiber and then another little fiber and another little fiber. It's just piling, piling, piling one on top of each other. And you end up getting like a hairball or a fiber ball, like as you could say, um, inside of the stomach. And because it's having a hard time passing out, it truly really just sits there and it can sit there for years. And the sad reality is, is they can't break it down. Um, in order to break down like polyester fiber, you have to, you can break it down with acid, but you have to have a combination of acid and heat. The amount of heat that you have to have to actually break it down, like is not compatible with life. Um, so even though they may have, um, you know, acid in their stomach, they're not going to be able to break it down because they're not generating the heat that needs to work in that chemical reaction to break down, to use the acid and heat together to break down that polyester fiber. Um, you can also break it down with lye, but the problem is, is that's also gonna be breaking down other tissues. So it's not like you can give that to a patient to break these synthetic fibers down in the GI tract without killing your patient. Um, so it's, it's a real sad problem when, when this occurs. Now the problem is, I wrote down there at the bottom, sometimes these things are hard to determine what actually is going on because a lot of times when these birds come into the hospital, um, the history is extremely vague on them. It's more like, well, they just seem a little bit off, if they even seem a little bit off. Sometimes they may be like doing something else, like picking their feathers. And then you think, oh, well, there might be one of these other many problems that makes the bird want to pick its feathers. Or sometimes they're regurgitating. Um, and you think, oh, well, there's all these other problems that can cause regurgitation, like an infection or um, a toxin. Um, or sometimes they are just skinny. They have a, a good appetite, they're eating, but they're just skinny. And so you start to worry that there might be some other problem like an organ dysfunction issue. And so they don't, the way that they present is very vague and it can be associated with a whole bunch of other potential diseases going on. So what we'll often do, you know, we do our physical exam and then we say, well, you know, this could be from a variety of problems. You know, if you're regurgitating, losing weight, what have you. So let's do some diagnostics to work this up and identify what is actually going on with this patient. In this x-ray that I have here, this little bird, um, what we can see, when we're looking at x-rays with the orange, you guys, um, everything that's really 
bright white is minerals. Everything that's black is gas and all the shades of gray in between are fluids and soft tissues. Uh, the bird's head is kind of up here at the top. Its legs are pulled down and its wings are to the side. The picture of this bird's internal organs here should look really symmetrical from one side to the next. And when we look at this bird, we can see it's not symmetrical. There's a bulge over here and then a bulge over there. This bulge that's over here is not normal. This is actually a dilation of the stomach. And when we do this other view, so we always do two views when we do x-rays, um, the head of the bird is over this way, the tail's this way, and the wings are kind of up at the top and the legs are pulled down. When we look at the uh, stomach margin here, I can follow the esophagus down. And then I have this large odd structure in the back part of the abdomen where I actually can't really tell what's going on back there. I can't see individual organs or intestines the way that I should. And I can in fact see like a bit of gas building up um, in the stomach. So when I see this on an x-ray, I can say, oh gosh, there's something odd going on with this bird's proventriculus. It's the upper portion of the stomach. So that helps narrow things down a little bit for me. And I go, okay, well, there's you know, X, Y, Z diseases that could cause the stomach to be dilated. We need to do more tests to tell which one of those diseases it is now. So we took our broad diagnostic, um, figured something out from it, and now we have to do more narrow diagnostics to really know what's going on. So what we did with this case is we did what's called a barium series, where we give it a contrast agent that lights up. Um, and that contrast agent is moving through the intestinal tract and we watch it, we take a series of x-rays as we watch it move through the intestinal tract and we see what it's doing and where it's highlighting that, and that way that it moves through and what it's highlighting can help us identify what's going on. And so what we found in this particular individual is this is all the stomach, the proventriculus leading into the ventriculus. And this is very abnormal. And I, I should have put a normal x-ray um, next to this to really identify and help you guys see how abnormal this is. But I just want to basically say that this is an extremely dilated proventriculus. And you can tell that the barium, this white stuff that they've swallowed, we're watching move through the intestinal tract, is really full like down here where it's moving through lower portions of the intestines. But here in the stomach is kind of this splotchy appearance. If you look down here, the uh, intestines are sort of superimposed over it. But again, you can see sort of this sort of splotchy appearance. So that's because there's a space occupying structure sitting in that proventriculus that the barium has to move around. So the barium sort of outlining it a little bit and it's taking its time to get through down to the lower intestines. So um, in this particular bird, it went to surgery and that's what was pulled out of the, the stomach, the proventriculus of this bird. And that is Happy high, <laughs> the happy hut fibers all congealed together. Um, and when I, when we talk to the owner, they say, well, yeah, the bird's been chewing on that thing for years and we just change it, um, as, it as he needs new ones because he's torn it apart. So this stuff has probably been sitting there for a long time, slowly building up. Um, so, you know, it's, and the, the sad reality about this, um, and I hate to say this, but it's the truth, is that most of these birds die. Most of these little conures that have this stuff stuck in them end up dying. Um, if they're bigger, they've got a better chance, but when they're real tiny, like little green cheeks, it just causes a lot of damage. So um, sad thing, thankfully, I probably only see a case of this again, maybe once a year, maybe sometimes I get little clusters. It's not like I see it multiple times a week, um, but these are really sad cases when they, when they happen. So rare in comparison to some other diseases and problems we see, but something that's important to know about. So if anybody uses these happy pets, be very, very, very cautious of them with um, on yours in particular. Okay. Um, and then this last one that I wanted to go over, I just one more case before I start uh, opening up for questions. Um, this one is just, in the fascinating category, um, because it's really, really, I think, pretty interesting that we can do this with birds. Now, um, again, like I said earlier, I'm kind of bad sometimes about taking pictures, so uh, some of the quality of the images here may not be the best, I apologize. Um, one thing I forgot to do with this case is I forgot to take a picture uh, beforehand to show what a cataract looks like in a bird, but there was a bird recently uh, named Sunbeam that presented to the hospital with cataracts. And we do see birds with cataracts quite frequently. Uh, I have a picture that I got offline, there's a little reference for it, um, of a little lovebird with a cataract. And you can see, here's our eye, 
we have the nice brown iris and then right in the center of that iris, you can see that sort of hazy thing in the center of that, um, well, it's in the lens itself. Um, what that haziness is, is actually a cataract that is in that bird's eye. Now, if you have a full cataract, a mature cataract, you can't see past that. Um, so that bird is blind in this eye. So um, I do see cataracts frequently in birds. We will often see them associated with like older age changes or if there's been some trauma to the lens that can cause it to form a cataract. Um, so we do see this problem frequently, but not everybody is able to or wants to do the surgery that you can do for remove cataracts. Uh, but Sunbeam uh, is very lucky and her owners elected to go forward with surgery because she had a cataract in both of her eyes. And so she was fully blind. Um, and they were concerned about it affecting her quality of life, you know? So she uh, went to the ophthalmologist. Now, cataract surgery is not something that I do. Uh, cataract surgery is something the ophthalmologist does. The ophthalmologist has very specialized equipment, but oftentimes it takes the two of us working together um, because you know, me or my team will go uh, help with like the anesthesia part of the surgery and um, the ophthalmologist does the actual surgery itself. And so what is going on here is this is Sunbeam under anesthesia um, and she has a very bright light shining on her face here and you can kind of see her eye here. Um, there is a little bit of tape that we use to tape the, the tube in. And here you can kind of see that endotracheal tube a little bit better going down into her trachea so that we can deliver oxygen and anesthesia um, to the trachea and make its way down to the lungs where it needs to be in order to work. Um, but when she's laying here on the surgery table, you can kind of see she's got a little bit of hazy appearance to that, to that lens and that's because of the cataract. Um, and then this other picture is just taken back from a little further. Again, she has that little really bright light because I'll show you a picture in just a second, but the ophthalmologist has, again, very specialized equipment that is allowing her to uh, actually look through a um, microscope and do surgery uh, while looking through the microscope. And she has to have a very bright light on her so she can illuminate everything and see what, what she needs to do for surgery. Um, but again, this patient is has the little ECG leads on her. She's got her IV catheter in. This little nice pillowy like thing that she is on is actually um, a warming uh, blanket that she has. So a lot of stuff that we're doing to keep our patients um, well supported while they're under anesthesia. So uh, this is Dr. Reed doing, doing the surgery, the ophthalmologist doing the surgery. Um, so right up here is her microscope and I'll show it in another picture, but here she is working down um, on Sunbeam doing the actual cataract removal. So here's, here's that scope. So look at this gigantic scope that she's actually set up. It's a very specialized piece of equipment. She is using the microscope to look through there and she has to have great hand-eye coordination um, in order to be able to work on that tiny little eye of that Amazon parrot. And she's using these very specialized, delicate, teeny tiny tools to do this surgery. So it's really quite fascinating. I mean, ophthalmologists do some really amazing work, but to get to watch Dr. Reed do this surgery on um, a little eyeball was just totally fascinating. Um, and what's amazing is after the surgery, here she is, she's waking up in the anesthesia. Um, we, had to put, we had to put a collar on her because this is something where if she scratches her eyes, she could undo everything we did. So she has to wear a collar for a couple of weeks after, but she has her eye open here and she's actually seeing us. And she's kind of squinting because she hasn't had vision for some time. Um, and so probably a little like uh, intense having a lot of light. So she kind of squints a bit initially, but she's actually able to see us now. And so it's, it's really quite, cool because this bird who was um, not able to, to see before now can see. So I, I think that's really amazing and, and quite fascinating. And um, I wanted to show that one just because it's something that I think not people don't always realize that this sort of surgery can be done with birds. And so it's cool to present it and show that, yeah, it is something we, we can do. So, all right, I'm going to stop sharing because I think that was my last slide. It was. So, okay, I am uh, happy to take any questions people have. Oh, wow, well, that was fascinating, especially, oh my gosh, so that bird can see now, that's just so touching. Like, that's, it's amazing. Um, wow, and how, that, that that's an older Amazon, right? Because it's the, uh, the yellow was all the way. Yeah, yeah. yep, she was, uh, I think she's in her, like, mid-30s, so. 
still some years ahead. Now she can see them. So that's, <laughs> that's even yeah. Uh, so let's see um, if we have time for some questions. Well, people are just fascinated by the presentation as it as was I. Um, and uh, let's see, we do have some questions. I probably won't get to all the questions, but um, oh, you know, um, someone did ask if other um, items. You know, you mentioned the with the conure in the in the the hut. Um, if palm like the the chewing toys, like the the palm pieces that you see on on toys, can that can that ever be a problem? The, you know, the good news is when it comes to like the palm pieces, any sort of um, natural fiber things, you know, like um, sisal rope um, or uh, yeah, like the palm pieces, leafy things, those actually are, are okay. So they do make those like happy hut like things out of plant fibers too. I've seen those available and those are the safer route to go because if they chew those things up, that sort of stuff, they can break down easier. Um, so it's sort of the safer route. Okay, that's good to know. And then someone had a question about, um, um, let's see, where did it go? Okay, if you if you leave the ovary um, in, um, can't the eggs still form like that and be um, ec um, ectopic? Okay, yeah. that is actually a really good question to ask um, because when we think about spaying or neutering, or neutering a dog or a cat, you remove the ovary where the follicles are coming off of, and you also remove the oviduct uterus where the follicles come down and you know the babies are sitting inside the, the uterus. We don't remove the ovary in birds because of the fact that it's sitting right next to important blood vessels. It's like laying right on top, like smack on top of those blood vessels. And it's hard to get underneath there with surgical instruments to safely clamp off the blood supply and take the ovary completely. If they're really, really, really young, like like juveniles, then sometimes you can actually go in and like just peel it off because if the vessels haven't like developed well enough for it to be a major source of bleeding. Um, but nobody's really doing doing that in, in young birds because it still is a risky procedure. Um, I do know one individual who does take the ovary, but even he has said that when that ovary is removed, um, there still could be some follicular material left behind. So therefore a lot of people say, well, if there's a little bit of material left behind, um, why risk how likely it is that you can actually hit that important blood vessel and make your patient bleed out and die during surgery. Yeah. So we just don't, we don't take it. And we just remove the oviduct. What is supposed to happen, and not all birds read the book, but what is supposed to happen is they're supposed to be talking essentially between the ovary and the oviduct. And so with hormones. And so if the oviduct is not there sending signals to the ovary saying, I'm ready to, you know, have a follicle pop off and make an egg because it's gone, that hormonal signaling is gone, then the ovary is supposed to go, well, I'm gonna shrink up and be tiny and um, not ovulate anymore. But again, not all birds read the book. Um, and there is a percentage of birds that that follicle is, the ovary is still producing large follicles. And then they can ovulate into the abdomen, but when they ovulate into the abdomen and don't have um, the, the oviduct itself, the only thing that they're ovulating into the abdomen is the yolk. And so that's when you have a egg yolk coelomitis. And it's not an ectopic egg because an ectopic egg is the full like egg formed that then just, again, like pumped back up out of the oviduct and it's free in the abdomen. Um, so it's, it's egg yolk coelomitis. Now, the good news is most birds won't do that after they spay, but there are some individuals who will. And if that is the case, then we manage those medically often with hormone therapy. Wow, okay. Uh, hang that is so fascinating. I, I mean, especially that 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 photo that you the image that you showed, um, which I eventually thought was like a Cheeto that got. I mean, that's just <laughs> I never knew I could do that. So um, wow. Okay. Um, so so uh, we do have some. We do have a lot of questions, but I, I, I will maybe we can address those um, at another webinar or via email. So thank you to everybody who who did submit a question. Sorry we didn't get to it, but um, I think that was well worth going through all those slides and and just finding out all these really interesting. I mean, like you you really did hit the button on rare and interesting cases that were in the title of this presentation. So that was very interesting. Thank you so much, Dr. Lamb. Um, so I, I'm going to announce. Uh, let's see, today's winner because we do have a giveaway. Yeah, you know, every every webinar so far. Um, and that is going out to Deborah E. And um, and as as I I'm going to show, of course, love it, love it, love it. Another um, video of put the royal with today's giveaway <laughs> prize. 
I will show you that video in a second. Um, and before I before I move on to that, because I want to make sure I, I really express next Friday is our big, I mean, it's a it's our first and let's see how this goes. This is going to be so exciting. We're going to do the gray, the gray way with um, Lisa Bono, but it's going to be holiday gift guides. So uh, Lisa's going to go over um, a bunch of um, amazing bird products. So if you haven't done any Christmas shopping or holiday shopping for your flock, you want to tune in because not only is she going to go over um, the hottest new bird items and the standard uh, true ones that have been around for years, she's going to, we're going to be giving them, giving a lot of this stuff away. It's going to be, um, you're, you're going to really want to join in because you can one, find out what uh, things you want to maybe buy for your bird, treat them to something nice, especially during the holidays. And two, you might be able to win it. So, um, so definitely you want to, don't want to miss this one. It's going to be um, prizes galore. So uh, <laughs> with that being said, uh, Dr. Lam, again, thank you so much for walking us through this. Um, and I am going to play, oh, cross fingers. This goes right because Arroyo is, she's, he's, I mean, just so awesome with these videos. I love them dearly. Uh, this is the prize that's going out to you, Deborah, today. And here we go, crossing fingers at my screen share. Goes well today. Here we go. Okay. Hey, Arroyo, how are you going to get another Nutriberry? Hmm, thinking about opening it up. Hey, Arroyo, how are you going to get oh, no, another no, 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 no. <laughs> I got a better idea. Yeah. I've got some right here. Hmm, hey, thinking about opening it up. You want one of these? I got a better idea. Can I get a high five? Okay. Some right here. High five. Hey, Arroyo. Good boy. You want one of these? Hmm, <laughs> sorry. Can I get a high five? High five. Oh, Good boy. Goodness. Mm. Tropical fruit nutriberries. <laughs> it's Kaya. Kaya. Mango. I just going to get some too. <laughs> love it. Love it. So there you go. Tropical fruit, neutral berries. It's all that goodness in there. Uh, yeah, and I, I, I'm sure Arroyo's just digging all these uh, these promo videos because he yeah. has to try everything. <laughs> yep. <laughs> all right. Here we go. Oh, look, another one. Oh. <laughs> I didn't know he knew all these tricks. Oh, that is a good boy. Okay. There you go. <laughs> all right. Awesome. <laughs> thank you so much, everybody. Thank you, Dr. Lamb. And um, until next time, remember, tune in next Friday. We got some giveaways. Um, have a great weekend. In the meantime, all the best to you and your flock. And everyone stay safe. Have a great weekend, everyone. Bye. Bye.